guys, my name is Praveena and I'm the president of Crook Society. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got our lovely alumna who's going to give us a little bit of advice on what happens post uni. And um, we're really lucky to have her with us um, and take time from her busy schedule. So thank you so much for coming and listening. What we've done actually for this event, Crooks has come up with a bunch of questions that we think you guys will like answered and um, we're going to ask um, Sajini each question that was going to basically take her through from her time at UCL all the way to where she's working now. And if you guys have any more questions, please put it in the Q&A. These are just kind of starter questions to get you get your interests peaked. Um, and now I'll hand over to Sajini to introduce herself. Hi everyone, um, I'm super excited to be here. Praveena and the UCL Biochemical Engineering Department have asked me really nicely to come and speak to you guys about careers after biochemical engineering and engineering at UCL. So um, this is totally at your disposal. Feel like you can ask any questions you like. Um, Praveena's really nicely put together some really good questions that she thinks might be useful. But like she said, anything that you guys want to ask, it's totally open. Um, feel free to ask absolutely anything. Um, I'll give you guys a quick background. So I graduated in 2015 from the biochemical engineering department. Um, I had an amazing, amazing time um, with loads of different professors, which I think you guys still work with, such as Ellie and Nigel. Um, and then I went into banking straight after that. Um, I worked at a company called HSBC in New York, and then I came back to London and worked at a company called Evercore. Um, working in mergers and acquisitions, um, advising technology and healthcare companies. Um, and now I decided to come into the healthcare sector again, um, and I'm working at a healthcare startup called Huma. Um, and my role is really, um, it's really focused on strategy and corporate development. So I'm really excited to talk to everyone today. Brilliant. Um, so let's start with the questions. Kim, can we go to the next slide? Brilliant. So our first question is, um, how was your time within the UCL Biochemical Engineering Department and what's the one thing you miss the most? Um, okay, so I think I had a really, really fantastic time. Um, when I kind of think back at, at my time, I think it was probably one of the most formative times of my life, um, probably because of the people that I met. So that includes obviously Nigel and Ellie, who I think have completely shaped my personality and my career. Um, to even some of the people that I met on the course, so I was telling Praveena about this, um, and I've been able to stay best friends with a lot of the people that I've met uh, during all the projects that I did and all the courses that we did together. Um, so I had a really, really positive time at UCL. Um, and I think that the great thing about this uni and this degree, well, first of all, UCL is multidisciplinary. So you can go outside your course and you can meet people who study economics and technology um, and finance. And you can also meet people obviously in the biochemical engineering cohort that have a very a, a huge variety of different interests um, as well. And I think that's probably the best part about UCL, that you're not just studying with scientists, you're not just studying with economists, you're studying with people from all different backgrounds with all different interests. Um, and I would just say really, really make the most of that experience um, because what I think that UCL and especially the biochemical engineering department do is really give you the tools to be so successful in your career um, and it's really up to you, I think, once you leave uni, um, whether or not you decide to make the most of that. Um, I think probably the part that I miss the most, um, I guess this is a bit corny, but I would say that I definitely miss the people. So some of my best friends, like I said, are people who are biochemical engineering alumni. Um, when you're doing all these projects, these late nights, um, you're never going to have to do that again um, with those people. And so I'd say make, make the most of that time because everyone you're working with is super, super intelligent. Um, learn from them and learn with them. There's just not another opportunity to learn with people like this. Um, and I would also say what I really miss is actually being, and I don't think I realized this until I left, you are totally at the forefront of innovation when you're, when you're learning this course. Um, I've tried to stay ahead of kind of the developments within the industry after leaving, and it is impossible um, for me to know as much as you guys know now, because the people that you're learning from um, and the topics that you're learning about are about 10 years ahead of marketing and commercialization points. So just be totally aware and just absorb, 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 because you guys are learning literally the most cutting edge research. So that's another thing I definitely miss. Brilliant, thank you so much. And the next question we have on the screen, thank you. Um, 
What advice would you give current students so that they can make the most of UCL, both academically and socially? I think you touched on a little bit in the last question as well, but what specific advice would you give us? Sure. Um, so I think I would just say balance is super important. Um, obviously, with engineering degrees, with biochemical engineering, you guys are going to be working super, super hard. Um, but try and kind of combine your kind of social timings with the work that you do. So during your projects, like I said, really kind of, you know, try and be friends and try and kind of get to know the people that you're working with. Um, try and really, really meet and socialize with as many students from this course, but I'd also say from other courses too. So one thing that I did was, um, and I wish I had really done more, more of, and I would massively encourage this, is to join as many societies as you guys can. Um, I think, first of all, obviously, tech is always going to be super relevant. So I would join tech societies, try and find any societies where you think, you know, you're super interested in a topic and try and align that to the societies that you join and really kind of submerge yourself within the people within there and just really integrate into as many of these as you can, because you need to be able to build a really strong network that you can lean on when you leave UCL, um, one for your career, but also just for yourself just for your enjoyment, just your social circle, your friendship circle, the more people that you can meet, the better it is for each of those things. Um, and if you feel like there's a society that doesn't really kind of align to your interests, I would just say form one. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's the resources that you could do that for. Um, and I would say, yeah, just kind of try and integrate that as much as you can. Try and integrate your social and your academics together. Um, and the one thing I, I think, again, the, probably the most important thing, um, really try and create strong relationships um, with the professors at UCL, especially in biochemical engineering. So before I left, I took down their emails. Um, I asked them to stay in touch. I actually do send them updates um, and that's how I'm talking to you guys now. So every time I switch jobs or every time I do a new healthcare deal or something that I think they would be interested in happens in my life and my career, I do uh, speak to Ellie and Nigel um, and they reply and they're really happy to hear from me. Um, and they've helped me a lot in my career. They're mentors, uh, they're friends, and obviously they're super impressive people to know. So I would say that's probably been the most important thing that I've done. Um, these people are, you know, of course, they're completely, um, they're completely leaders within the industry. So they're great people to know, um, but also um, they give really good advice. So I'd say that's probably the biggest thing. Make sure you stay in touch with all these professors um, because they're just a great support, ne support network once you leave UCL. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, um, just a quick thing, we just to let you know, we've had a couple of questions that come in. Praveena, would you like to uh, get to them now or do you want to hold them until we get to the end of the ones in the PowerPoint? Yeah, so I'm gonna, uh, I think I'll wait for some because some actually are gonna be answered in the next question that we have. So I'll try and integrate them while I, when I ask the questions. So the next one is, after university, how did you decide to go to go into investment banking and was there something else you considered and I know someone asked this in the Q&A as well yeah so um, I think probably the main reason I went into banking um, I did a few lectures I think maybe you guys might still do them with Ellie um, where she kind of touched upon the commercialization of specific therapies and medicines within biochemical engineering um, and so her modules all talk, taught me all about kind of the business side of healthcare. Um, and that's when I kind of realized I don't really want to do the research side um, of biochemical engineering or healthcare, but I did want to stay in the industry. Um, I didn't want to leave the industry. And I think that's probably the most important point to take home that you may not feel that you want to spend your time doing more research or development, but there are other ways in which you can really stay in healthcare. Um, and find an area which you find interesting. And that could be the commercial side, the marketing side, the business side, um, the strategy side. So that's kind of what I really learned from her lectures. Um, and I decided that I really wanted to understand how healthcare companies were built from a strategic and growth angle rather than from a pipeline and kind of manufacturing and processing side. Um, and so um, that's essentially how I decided to go into investment banking. Um, and I think I also, at the time, um, was picked particularly kind of, and this is one of the reasons I think I actually decided to pick this degree. Um, obviously, there's a lot in the markets about healthcare and biotech. Um, and so I knew that going into investment banking with a healthcare background on the knowledge that I have, um, I would be able to do well and succeed because I would have knowledge of the healthcare sector um, that would allow me to formulate much stronger investments um, and allow me to formulate some of the deals that I did. So I knew that coming into the industry and coming into and leaving uni, I had a really, really unique skill set 
um, just as you will do with this degree. Um, I think I'm just going to look at a, one of the questions actually talked about consultancy. So um, just actually before I came to Huma, um, I actually received a consultancy role um, from a company called McKinsey. And the reason that I decided not to join McKinsey was because um, I actually decided to join Huma um, because I wanted a better work-life balance. So one thing that I probably should warn you all guys about is um, the consultancy and investment banking side um, it does have its it does have its advantages, but it also is um, extremely tiring because you work very very long hours. Um, and when I was interviewing at McKinsey, I was told that um, my hours wouldn't be improved from banking. Um, I did feel as though I picked up a really kind of good skill set from banking in advisory and business analysis, and I felt that I didn't really need to go into consulting before coming into a healthcare company. And I was really looking for a better work life balance. So. That's basically the reason I didn't go into consulting before coming to Huma. Brilliant, thank you. And you touched a little bit on consulting as well, which is great, because I know a few people are considering a career in that. Um, so the next question is about, um, yeah, so you talk about going into banking and the skills that you have from the degree. So what advice would you give to current um, students or undergrads who are thinking about going into finance and investment banking? Yeah, so um, this is super important, I think. Um, banking and finance, um, it's very different to healthcare. So um, I think some of the things that really hit me when I got in was that it's not as collaborative. Um, as much as they say, it's not as um, innovative. Um, it's very exciting in different ways. So I worked on um, an acquisition um, I worked with PayPal, who were my client, and we acquired a company called iZettle. And um, there's a lot of excitement around that because when deals like that are leaked, it goes into the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal. And I was literally sitting there um, and my phone was popping up with all these alerts. And so that's an incredible feeling when you've worked on something that's almost like a secret to the world. Um, and then when it's leaked, it's huge and it's in all the news. And that's obviously a very, very exciting thing to happen. Um, however, I did feel like um, it wasn't enough to keep me in banking. Um, for those reasons as it wasn't collaborative and it wasn't innovative enough. Um, the way that these organi organizations are structured, uh, they're very hierarchical um, and that meant that I felt like I wasn't able to really explore my creativity or my kind of innovative mindset. However, I do think that when you begin your career, you probably have a lot more to learn than you realize uh, from a professional standpoint. And so I think I wouldn't discourage anyone from going into banking and finance at first, because I think that it gives you the grounding and the fundamental skill set to be able to be professional in the workplace. Um, but when you're really, if you are similar to me, or I think the other people that will probably be on this call, where you feel like you do want to explore, um, you know, your creativity and your kind of more innovative mindset, I think it's better to leave banking at that point and come into a more strategy uh, focused role and that's the reason why I left um, so I'd say just have the expectation um, about those things and just kind of go in with that understanding um, I think it's a great it's a great start to your career um, and I think that everyone I think the great thing about this degree is that we are taught elements of business development we are taught elements of commercialization and understanding the business landscape um, and I think that that is only obviously enhanced when you go into a role like banking or finance. But those are definitely things I would be very aware of before you go into the industry. Um, that leads us nicely on to the next question, actually. So loads of people think having studied uh, biochemical engineering, which is quite niche in itself, how do we fit as graduates into a world of business? Yeah. OK, so I'd say this course has absolutely set me up for my career in banking and finance. So first and foremost, um, I was taught the most important healthcare trends and obviously that's personalized and preventative medicine. And even just those, literally those three words have taken me through interviews, have taken me through careers. Um, you wouldn't believe like people don't know this. Um, normal people don't know that that's what's coming. Normal people don't realize the extent of that. And we are taught this every single day in our course. So. I can't describe or kind of emphasize enough how incredibly lucky you all are to be in this course. Um, I know that when I was applying for my job at Huma, um, I actually got the role just because I was speaking about something that Ellie told us. Um, she was explaining to us how 
at the time, and this was five years ago, but it's still happening. Big pharma companies obviously had a very dry pipeline. They weren't able to kind of successfully um, you know, do a lot of R&D. And so what they would do instead is they would acquire small biotech companies, um, and that would be to kind of enhance their pipelines. Um, and I talked about how that was really useful for small companies in terms of commercialization. And my manager was like, oh, amazing. OK, that's what we do here. We need someone who understands that we can acquire companies to commercialize these incredible innovations. And that's how I literally got my job. So it 100 percent helps you. When I was in my banking interviews, um, they will always ask you what are the trends in the sectors that you're most interested in. You will be one of met, like very few people that will have an interest in a specific sector and then also be able to talk about that in your interviews. And that's so valuable. Um, I passed so many interviews just because I had a specific interest in the sector. And many people at your age when you graduate don't actually have specific interests. And so the fact that you've, you know, you've done this course, you've developed a very specific interest that will just really, really, really help you um, in due course. And I'd say also, um, just apart from kind of the trends and the knowledge that you learn, <clears throat> the variety of kind of, and I think this is really due to the way that this course is structured, the breadth of activities, the variety of activities. So you guys are going to be on projects, you're in group work, labs, competitions. I remember I did, um, I think I did a project with PwC where we basically built a business plan for some spin-offs at UCL, which is incredible. Um, and then I remember we had speakers come in like Barry Buckland. I don't know whether you guys have heard from him yet. Um, even some of the modules like systems engineering, process optimization is super, super, super important um, when you get into the real world. And there are so many facilities and there's so much variety within this course. Um, it's just the biggest opportunity. I can't explain it enough. And it's all about how you talk about it when you go to interviews. It's all about how much you've absorbed when you're doing your degree. And that's why I would just emphasize absorb as much as you can because these tech skills that you guys are going to learn, whether that's MATLAB, systems, you know, the healthcare trends you're going to learn about, the people that you're going to hear from, the industry contacts that you're going to make, all of this is so incredibly um, useful. And if you, use, if you use all these things, you'll be able to do so, so well. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, once, uh, this is actually a question that was um, asked by one of our attendees. Uh, so, in my understanding is you did the integrated masters, yes, in, in the department. Yeah. Um, what made you decide to do the masters instead of um, just a BEng? And do you think there's a significant difference when you are a graduate entering the w field of work, having the difference between having a masters or a um, BEng? Yeah, so I think that it really depends, obviously, if you're going into banking and consulting, and this is probably one of the reasons I left, um, I do feel like people typically will not do a master's um, and they will end up just doing the three year course and then going straight into a consulting or banking course. I think that them having the master's was able was a differentiator for me. So I was able to show that I could study for an extra year. Um, and also it depends, on, it depends on what your master's is, is on, right? So my master's was all about, um, it was actually the bioprocessing business management master's. So it was talking about um, you know, everything to do with commercialization of medicines, manufacturing, everything. So that gave me what I believe is a lot more talking points when I was in interviews that were related to business interviews. And so I think if you are looking to go into business consulting, finance, investment banking, doing that master's, if it's still around, is the best thing that you can do. Um, I remember I could opt to take finance modules and um, I think that's an incredible opportunity because I wouldn't have learned accounting and I wouldn't have been so great at my job in investment banking. I think I also was able to learn project management. So again, that's another really, really um, important skill set if you're doing kind of a role in a startup like I am right now. So um, I would highly encourage it. I don't think there's any in my head. And I, I remember speaking to my friends at the time. There's just so there's no negative. Like you guys are going to get to the opportunity to do the MEng, and it's going to be, I think, the same price as the undergrad years. And it costs everyone else so much more to do a master's. And you get to hang around with your friends at UCL for longer, learn more and more from these amazing professors. I don't know why you wouldn't do it. I think that having a master's in my life has set me apart from so many people. Um, and I think it may have been the funnest year for me, just in terms of the learning opportunities. So I would highly encourage it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so after having spending so many years in finance, what made you decide to come back to the healthcare sector? Yeah, so 
Um, I'd say I was probably quite bored. Um, over the thing with finance and consulting um, and investment banking and all the lovely services companies is um, it's not as exciting as healthcare. And so and it's not as exciting as, um, you know, all the different things that we're learning. And you do a process um, and you end up repeating that process. So, for example, I was advising companies and I advised um, a tech company. I advised PayPal and then I ended up advising a healthcare company. And what I found quite disappointing is that the processes didn't differ that much. Um, that was obviously really disappointing for me because I was just like ready to go and use all my healthcare knowledge when I came to the healthcare client. Um, but sadly, I felt as though um, I couldn't really use my skill set or my knowledge. And I think that that's um, the fault of the banking sector, that they don't really um, understand how to fully utilize kind of the knowledge and the abilities of people within institutions themselves. And that's something that I found deeply unfulfilling. Um, I couldn't see myself staying and continuing to advise on transactions that were very repetitive. Um, and so that's when I decided um, to kind of look back on what I had found most interesting and in kind of my you know, since I had actually started studying. Um, and I realized I felt most happiest when I was learning in the healthcare industry. I felt most motivated when I was learning engineering. Um, and I really wanted to also make the most of my healthcare network. And that began at UCL uh, with all the other biochemical engineers that I knew. Um, but most of all, I think if you have chosen to do this degree, you have an interest in biochemical engineering. And I really wanted to be able to be in a place where I felt that that was valued. Um, and I think probably the last reason why I was motivated, which is quite funny, I watched a documentary um, on Netflix, um, which Bill Gates made, and it was all about how he is now literally spending all of his time in the healthcare industry. So this is someone who, you know, created Microsoft. He is a tech junkie, tech entrepreneur, and even he has pivoted his entire life. He's given his company for other people to manage. And he said, right, I'm going to focus on healthcare. Um, and I just thought to myself, why on earth am I not making the most of my healthcare background? If people like him, who, you know, they're, they're very, very intelligent, they know exactly, you know, what the most important things and the most resilient industries are, um, and they're working on healthcare, I want to be in healthcare again. Um, obviously, COVID has shown us that healthcare is super resilient. And I also think I was at a time when COVID was happening, and I wanted to be able to contribute to COVID and help patients of COVID and help patients within the healthcare industry during this time. So there are a few reasons there, but I hope that covered uh, the question. Yeah, I think you have. Um, apart from how Netflix affects our lives, <laughs> how um, <laughs> healthcare is super important as well. So the next question is actually about your current role in um, Huma. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the company and what your actual role there is. Yeah, of course. So Huma is a super exciting company. Um, we are a digital health company and we do kind of two main things. So the first thing that we do is provide remote patient monitoring. So what this means is through literally our app, which is on a phone, we can actually care for patients whilst they are at home. Um, and the way that we do this is we're building kind of a platform and an ecosystem where you can measure all your vital signs literally through the sensors on your phone. So that really includes absolutely everything. Right now we're working with a company to build um, an oximeter that will use what we can literally implement through our phones. Um, we actually have um, developed a tool where you literally put your finger on the torch of your phone and you can measure your heart rate variability. Um, and also, we also have a tool where you can put your phone on your chest and um, you, the, um, you can actually measure your breathing rate. And so what we've done is uh, we've combined this with telemedicine and we work with the NHS. And the NHS, especially during COVID, what they did was they gave people our app when they were discharged from hospitals uh, if they had COVID, but they were told that there wasn't any more space and they weren't super high risk, but they still needed you know, that care at home, just in case they were going to deteriorate again. And so what medical professionals would do was use our app. They would track people's vital signs through the measurements that they were making through their phones. And if people were deteriorating, it would send off an alert and they would bring people back into the hospital um, and treat them before that um, before they became worse. So it truly is preventative healthcare and it's personalized. And I knew those two trends were super important for my biochemical engineering days. So I was like, okay, this is definitely where I want to be because I know that Ellie and Nigel and everyone has taught me that personalized and preventative medicine is the future. The other thing that we do, which is very cool, we work with companies like Apple 
um, and Tencent and Johnson and Johnson and Bayer to create digital biomarkers. So just like how I was talking about just now, where we, we take the sensors in the phone and we start to measure everyone's vital signs, we then look for patterns um, through the patients that we're following and we can come up with algorithms um, to understand if they are actually um, starting to become sufferers of diseases. So through, for example, an, it's a study that we've done with Tencent, through movements in your hand, um, we can detect if you've got early signs of Parkinson's. Um, so it's really trying to deliver remote patient care at home and trying to predict um, people's, um, you know, through all the data that we can collect in the phone, trying to predict if people are actually suffering from diseases. Sorry, that was super long. <laughs> um, my role quickly is based, um, because of my background, I help the company with their M&A. So we look at our platform and we try and see where are the gaps, what are we missing? And if there are companies in the market that are actually doing what we need, I try and acquire them for our company. Um, and that's a super exciting part of my role that I was also doing when I was in banking, but it's just way more interesting on this side um, where I can actually grow the company from the inside rather than you know, just advising all these companies that I was working for and handing over solutions and then never really feeling the impact of my decision making. So this is far more fulfilling. Um, and the other thing I do, which is really cool, um, apart from the fundraising process, um, which is also quite interesting, which I work with the CFO closely on, um, I'm actually currently working with the head of the US team. Um, she's the ex chief digital, bio, um, digital officer from Bayer. So she is an incredible lady to learn from. Um, and I'm helping her grow and expand into the US, um, helping her with strategy um, and business development. So yeah, it's an incredible, incredible role and I'm super, super happy. That sounds super brilliant. And I think you inspired people, honestly. People on the group chat have said how your answer was super helpful and may have helped them decide their future. So Amazing. thank you so much. Um, this is a question from one of our attendees. They are wondering, um, do you see yourself, where do you see yourself in five years? Do you still think you would be at Huma? Yeah. So I think this is interesting because if someone had asked me this in banking, um, I just wouldn't have, no I wouldn't have known how to say it politely. No. Um, but yeah, I absolutely do see myself at Huma. I think that the reason I joined this company is because I could see how fast it was going to advance and how well it was going to advance in the next five to 10 years. Um, apart from the amazing work that I described, um, the people are amazing. Um, everyone is so intelligent. Everyone, like I said, Jess, for example, comes from Bayer. She was the chief digital officer. We have our commercial officer who was actually the CEO of HCA, which you guys might know is a private hospital brand in the UK. Um, we have incredible people to learn from um, at this company, but also more than that, um, people really thank you for your work. And so I end up working harder and even longer than I did um, in banking, but I actually enjoy it. And so that's not to put anyone off. It is my choice. Um, they actually encourage me not to work this hard because they're so nice. But you do want to work harder when people are thankful and when you believe that the vision and the mission of the company is good. Um, and so I think in short, absolutely, I would love to stick around um and yeah i'd love to see like loads of you guys there too yeah i'm sure you will but, um the next question is also from uh, one of the attendees do you think it's possible to acquire a strategy role in a company without having finance or consulting backgrounds um so i think it's difficult because you have to be able to demonstrate that you have had experience um either in a process where you are doing acquisitions or in a process where you're helping to formulate the strategy of companies however i do think that if you go to a company like a pharmaceutical company and work on the business development side that's also an option i've seen people do that um i don't think it's it's very and this is probably one of the only kind of reasons I would encourage people to do banking and consulting um, to get into one of these roles. And I think that as, as, as if you really do want one of these roles where you're kind of working on the business side of a pharma or a med tech or a medical company, go into banking, go into consulting, do it for two or three years, literally three years maximum. It's all you need to do. Um, and you can absolutely do this role, but I'm not sure whether it would be possible without doing the banking or the consulting route. Oh, I think you're on mute, Pravina. 
I was on mute. <laughs> You'd think I'd be better at this, but I'm not after a week of online lessons. Um, one more question. I think it's the one I had um, on, on the slide deck. So if we go forward a couple more slides, Kim, um, and then we can come back to loads of attendees questions. Um, I think it's very important, especially with what you were talking about, the other next one as well, Kim, um, especially with what you do in Hu Huma, with um, there being an aging population and so many um, people kind of relying on uh, phones, etc. Of course, the most um, kind of easy and scalable way to get healthcare Exactly. to people is through the phone um so the real question is i mean you said it you know five years ago ellie told you that you know these things are going to be prominent in healthcare do you think it's changed what do you see is going to be the next thing in healthcare innovation yeah so i think i should be asking you guys this because like i said i really do think that this department just sets you up um you guys are really genuinely um, speaking from inside the industry now, you guys are 10 years ahead. Um, and I have tried, by the way, to keep up. I've tried to sign up to webinars, seminars, read books, and I don't think I've ever been um, inundated with as much knowledge as I was when I was doing the course. So just, again, absorb as much as you can while you're here. Um, but my kind of stance on this would be that there's um, definitely a trend right now. When I was at uni, it was all about the research and development and the manufacturing of cell and gene therapy and the challenges with scale up. And I'm sure you guys are probably some of the people that have been able to solve these issues. But now it's all about commercialization. So I don't know if you guys know this, but Farlan, who lectured me, um, he actually has founded a company called Ori Biotech. Um, and what's incredible is that Jess, who I said um, I, I actually work with um, in Huma, who is actually from the US, has actually heard of Ori. So that's just to kind of explain to you guys that this department is phenomenal. This department is the most innovative department in the world for biochemical engineering because we have professors, alumni who are spinning out companies like Ori, where people all over the world are hearing about it. And that company is looking at basically trying to scale up the manufacturing of cell and gene therapy. And if that works, like phenomenal, and he'll have so many investors and he will do supremely well. So my point is, I think we're moving into the commercialization stage now of cell and gene therapy rather than kind of the research and development, which is when I was at UCL, what was important. Um, I think that something that I touched upon just now is super important. So digital biomarkers. So this is, in my opinion, um, the most we've come close to personalized and preventative healthcare. Preventative because if you track people's vitals, you know, on a more consistent basis, even continuously, which you can do through your phone, um, you are able to pick up people when they are deteriorating and treat them and therefore prevent disease before it actually happens. So another thing that we're looking at is um, actually looking at keystrokes. So how people are flicking through their text messages, their Instagram, would that give people, would that give scientists a sign um, if someone has developed a neurological disorder and we can be able to, we are able to pick that up quicker than a doctor can. Um, and also obviously more frequently because you wouldn't have to go into the surgery for someone to be able to like, you know, track the way that you're swiping. So things like this are hugely transformative and just being able to collect all that data and create digital biomarkers. Um, that's a huge trend. And we're the only company in Europe um, and the rest of the world, apart from the US that do this. So there are a couple of companies in the US that do what we do, which is create biomarkers, but we're the only ones in Europe and the UK. So I think that would probably be the second trend. And then the third one um, that I think is really interesting is just uh, generally, I think that the healthcare sector has really begun to adopt technology. And I think obviously that's happened because of coronavirus. Um, I know that when, um, for example, before coronavirus, telemedicine wasn't really a big thing. Doctors weren't really using AI. They were scared to use AI. They were scared of inaccuracies. They were scared of, you know, wrong diagnosis. But now I think coronavirus with the NHS X, which is kind of the tech, the tech um, part of the NHS, they've really pushed forward the need for tech um, within the healthcare and the medical industry. Um, and doctors are finally learning that actually tech is facilitative in their decision-making process. Um, and it can aid diagnosis rather than, you know, create errors. And so I think that's another huge trend. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we had uh, one question about, um, I suppose, the kind of freedom you have in your work 
yeah. place. Uh, do you think you've worked in some really corporate settings as well as in the case of Puma, where you've got more freedom, I guess, in um, your work? How did how, how did you feel when you were in like a corporate setting? Was that really challenging for you, yeah. um, mm -hmm. or not, uh, etc.? Yeah, so it That's was very challenging. Good. <laughs> it was really challenging. Um, I think the reason it might have been more challenging for me than others is because of this course, because I think you're encouraged during your degree to collaborate and speak and innovate and be creative all the time. So I found that the people that did finance and economics, um, economics courses, they didn't really have a huge issue with this, whereas I felt as though I felt stunted. I felt like I couldn't grow. Um, it really, it, it felt like a genuine pain because I couldn't really express myself. And that sounds a bit weird but it, it is the reason that I left and I couldn't see myself growing um, and humour is totally different I was talking to Jess uh, the other day about how we don't do anything in women's health and so women's health is a huge um, area that's completely untapped with investment and it annoys me a lot because 50% of the world are female and we don't have you know any therapies really for menopause or anything that we could all end up suffering from when we grow older or even some of the things we might suffer from now as females so she said right put a meeting in my diary and we'll talk to the head of johnson and johnson's women tech on thursday and it's like okay wow like we can really do that and we can really try and create collaborations um, and try and make the world a better place so that is the difference because when I was in banking I don't think I ever even was allowed to speak to a client um, without doing it through an email um, and that's hard because you have opinions and you want to help um, and not being able to speak it, it's a very strange thing because we're always taught to speak up and really use our brain so yeah I was allowed to send emails of course I was allowed to send research and updates um but it's a totally different environment um and yeah it was very very strange um I would just say if people are going to do it um if you like that kind of thing some people would do that's completely fine if you don't just the way that I tell some of the people that I kind of still mentor in banking see it as like a two-year thing um, and start to build up your network in startups in the health tech industry and healthcare sector in the tech industry and find a nice exit route so that when a position comes up, you're ready to get out. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and I think as uh, um, undergraduates, I think one of the main questions, burning questions we all have is where can I get is this idea that um, to get experience, you need experience, right? Yeah. So when you're applying to a position, they always want to know what experience you have. But uh, we're still kind of at the same position of where we were um, with the no experience. That's what I'm applying to yeah, the company for. So um, in terms of Huma and any other companies that you know of who are kind of startups or uh, in uh, digital healthcare and healthcare in general, but maybe the more commercial side. Um, do you know how, uh, do you know if they run internships and do you know how to approach companies for internships? Yeah, so I think probably the advice, I, advice I'd give you guys, um, and this is how I get, how I've got all my jobs. Um, sometimes there haven't been actual openings or positions, but just go on LinkedIn and try and find people who you think work for companies that you want to work for. So if you like Huma, find someone who was at UCL at Huma and just reach out to them and be like, hey, I also was at UCL and I find your company super interesting. Um, I would absolutely love to do some experience with you guys in the summer. I have some time in the summer. Um, I know there was a guy from UCL who actually worked part time at Huma. I think he did a biochemistry degree. I mean, he's just joined permanently and I think that's the way he did it. Um, there are so many health tech startups that you guys can do that with. And it, I always think just be smart about it. Find a common ground, find someone that looks nice on their LinkedIn, someone who's like smiling um, and send a really nice message and offer your time for free. Say, you know, I need the experience. I think this company looks really interesting to me and I want to learn. Um, I have X, Y and Z skills. I did these modules. I find this interesting. I found this article on your company, which is so interesting. I'd love to learn more. And that's kind of what makes people feel like you genuinely are interested rather than just saying, sending off a generic email to everyone in the health tech industry, which is kind of annoying because um, sometimes I, re I receive a few of those. So if someone actually kind of posted in my inbox and said, you know, I saw this article on Huma, it's super cool. Um, or um, I don't know if they're saying, oh, I'd love to know more about how your fundraising process is going. 
um, or I've heard about digital biomarkers and actually I was working on a module um, on personalized medicine at university. I, I wanted to discuss whether this is personalized medicine, like anything like that, that is way more riveting and way more encouraging for us to receive. Um, and that would probably definitely land you an internship um, or at least an interview. I think you just subjected yourself to like 30 private messages on <laughs> LinkedIn. <laughs> Um, another question that we did have is kind of to do with LinkedIn. Uh, guys, uh, please feel free to ask any more questions on the Q&A. This is one of the questions Crooks was actually debating on whether to put on the main list. Um, but we were thinking, you know, when you graduated from university, um, you went into investment banking in particular, yeah. but uh, did you have kind of summer placements and internships to do with investment banking? Yeah. And did you think that was kind of like the be all and end all of getting these uh, positions after graduating? Yeah. Um, because a lot of people, especially in the current crisis, were unable to secure um, placements or if the ones they have secured kind of fell through because uh, nothing could really happen yeah. in the summer. So do you think it's the kind of be all and end all of um, applications? Yeah, so I think, unfortunately, and this is one of the other reasons I don't really like uh, the banking industry, I think it is sadly, um, you do need an internship or you do need to get a spring week or something that shows that you have an interest. And I think it is literally for that reason that they want people, um, first of all, when you actually start the job and you're an analyst, which is your first year role, um, it's ridiculous, but they expect you to do a number of things before you even get onto the job. Um, and so because you're expected to do those things, you need an internship beforehand to be able to train you. Um, so it is really difficult. I know it is to get internships. I struggled with it and it's really hard. But I think it's about, um, you know, doing the apps as many as you can to all the different banks and all the different consultancy firms. But like I said, reach out to people on LinkedIn. Like I reached out to people before I applied and I was like, hey, I'm about to apply to Morgan Stanley. Um, I see you also went to UCL or I see you also did a healthcare degree. I would love to talk about how this is relevant to your role in investment banking. Um, and those people were able to fast track my application or they were actually able to help me during my interview um, and prep me for my interview. So it's, it's all about your network and it's all about trying to find common ground of people and getting that application that you're doing to be kind of fast tracked through the process. Um, and I'm also genuinely happy to help anyone um, kind of prepare for their interviews uh, for banking as well. But I do think it is essential. So it's about doing the apps, doing them properly. Don't send off cover letters to all 30 banks with the same, you know, writing. Look at the deals that they're doing. Like you guys are smart enough to know, you know, the different healthcare deals that are happening, if they're in telemedicine, if they're in cell or gene therapy, and look at what the deals that they're doing and try and relate that to something that you've learned about in your course and talk about that in your cover letter. Um, and that's kind of the way that I think that you can definitely pass all the different kind of screening rounds. Um, and again, I use my network. So when my friends were able to secure internships, I asked them how they did it. And then they were able to help me with my cover letters, et cetera. So use each other, work with each other, help each other. Um, and I'm also happy to help. Brilliant, thank you so much. And I think um, uh, that puts the application process into perspective for a lot of people, because it's a bit daunting. Mm -hmm. um, Brilliant. Uh, guys, feel free to add a little bit any more questions that you may have for Sajani before we have to let her go. <laughs> um, and then you bombard her on, on LinkedIn. Um, actually, just, perhaps if I can just chip in, somebody is actually asking you about um, uh, a LinkedIn account. So Sajani, perhaps you could just let people know what you think is really good and works well on a LinkedIn account and what maybe doesn't. Um, okay. It's quite difficult when you're starting off to know. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think obviously with you guys, um, like kind of Pravina touched on, try and just, it sounds horrible, but try and offer yourself for free in the summers. Um, so like, you know, this is really an ex a time where you have free, I understand you want to go on holiday. You can still do like a couple of months work experience. So try and just get as much work experience as you can that's related to the healthcare sector or related to like, the, if you're going into business or consulting or banking, try and find business related roles or, you know, any, anything like that. Again, some of the stuff I used to do, UCL as a whole, obviously it's multidisciplinary. So go to the finance society or go to the investment society 
Um, I'm sure there are so many things going on there and try and pick up on some of the things that they're doing. So I remember I did a competition um, as part of one of the economics or finance societies and it was basically modeling a merger. So I was able to put down that I was involved in that. Um, there are so many ways in UCL where you can kind of gain the right skills. And then, like I said before, you could opt to do the accounting and finance course that's offered during the masters, um, which I did, which was the bioprocessing masters. You can even try and talk to some of the professors and see if you can opt for whenever you have optional modules, opt for a finance course, stuff like that. So, and then put that in your LinkedIn, embed that in your LinkedIn, show that you're actively interested in the finance, um, in the consulting sector. With consulting, especially Ellie's modules are so useful. So when you are detailing your degree, um, talk about how you literally did a master's on consulting because that's what Ellie's masters are all about. They are um, looking and analyzing uh, healthcare companies on their business challenges and that's exactly what a consultant does. So detailing what you learned, tailoring the modules that you're listing on your kind of LinkedIn or on your CV to what the job application is, um, that's super, super helpful. And I'm, again, I'm happy to help people um, understand what I mean by this in more detail if that's not clear. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, just for those wondering, Ellie, uh, is, you'll know more and more about her as you go through the the course. Uh, she, You'll hear from her, I'm sure, in induction, probably. She runs a lot of the business side and the economics side of uh, the department, and she's also in charge of a uh, year in industry. So first years, don't fear, you will, you will hear from her. <laughs> um, she's a nice lady, so you should talk to her. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. thank you so much. Two, two or four. She's also the VP for the engineering VP for International or something. Wow. She's, she's got a really great profile at UCL. We're very lucky to have her. Yeah, very, very lucky. I was um, actually wondering uh, in terms of uh, you said it's all about networking. So um, when it comes to networking, did you find it kind of you were in a position where you want you had to kind of reach up to people already in these positions or do you think looking back your network as in your peers in UCL kind of supported you through that as well because I think there's a lot of uh, debate as to who is your network and like how do you make more because surely you know our peers we're kind of going through eventually we will be going through I guess in my case um, the career ladder as opposed to trying like win the win the favor of people who are already working in there. Yeah. So I think obviously the approach I took um, at first was to try and go external from UCL. And that's just because um, whenever you're kind of trying to get one of these positions or get one of these roles or an internship, um, you definitely need people on the inside of the companies to vouch for you. So I say the first step would definitely be reaching out to people at different institutions that have roles there that have been there for a long time, that have built their reputation internally. Um, and know exactly what the role entails so that they can help you but you're completely right and I think that my network um, helped me really prepare for um, everything that was happening during the interview process so I would practice with all my friends um, when I did the interviews and I would kind of they would help me with my case studies and my um, we, you have a lot of numerical tests if you're doing banking and finance so you can do those with your friends um, and then once you reach kind of my age and I'm quite old now um, you're able to kind of then lean on your network more. Um, and I know there are people I know from UCL, there's a guy who did computer science and now has launched like one of the best ed tech companies in the world. So he's a fantastic guy for us to know because he's an incredible um, fundraising process and Huma have actually leaned on him for support um, in our fundraising objectives. So your network at UCL is the best. And honestly, I can't explain it. Like this week I've actually been working with a girl who is in the biochemical engineering department with me and um, she's moved on to do a master's uh, sorry a PhD at Oxford and she's now helping us at HUMA um, through a partnership with Oxford test our platform for different use cases so keep in touch with everyone everyone is going to be doing incredible things because everyone's super super smart and one day it's going to help you so much and you can help them which is even better um, and you can continue to collaborate with each other and make each other's careers even better and better and yeah I can't even emphasize that enough because I think my friends and my peers from biochemical engineering including the professors which I really do um, reinforce are really 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 helpful um, everyone here has really provided me with the best 
um, platform to be able to just exceed so well um, in my career. And I know it's hard to envisage that when you're in your seats and you're wondering, like you said, how is this degree applicable to the real world? It really is probably the most applicable degree because you guys are learning about things which are more relevant in 10 years time than anyone else is learning, which is the best thing you could be doing. I hope that helps. <laughs> I think it really does. Thank you so much. And I think it's lovely to hear um, that five years on, you the kind of a feel of community that we get in our department kind of stays with you because I remember um, the committee kind of speaking to the first years about how that's our favourite part of this department. So it's really nice that it sticks with you and ten, uh, eight, five, ten years down the line that you look back to it and then you're still supporting each other. Yeah, 100%. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out and doing this talk. It's been super inspirational. And I know loads of the attendees have felt that way because my phone has been beeping a little bit on the side. Um, thank you so much for doing it. And uh, I'm sure many of us will um, get in touch with you if people are interested in digital biotech and health industries. Um, and in general, uh, thank you so much for also offering up more time <laughs> to do um, um, interview prep and perhaps case studies for those um, yeah. looking to go into consultancy. Uh, so Crooks will be in touch with you trying to sort that out in the near future. Thank you so much. Uh, Kim, would you like to say anything? Thank you guys so much. Uh, no problem. Just a huge thank you to Sajni. Uh, great thank you. Thank you, Praveena. Thank you, everyone who's joined and the questions were great. Just one little thing to point out, though, that, uh, that, that Sajni, uh, I was invited by Nigel, the dean of the uh, faculty, to get in touch with Sajni. Um, so, it, you know, the people that you, that you have contact with when you're doing your degree, you know, I, I, I often look at people I work around with and say, Thanks. in a couple of years' time, I'm going to say, I work with that person. So... <laughs> You know, thank you for coming back. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah, great. And um, yeah, have a great day. Have a great evening and look forward to um, the next time we get in touch. Cheers. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone who came and finally managed to log in. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.